Welcome to boot camp. I'm your drill sergeant this morning. <laughs> I expect all of you to leave drenched in sweat and tears. Uh, uh, we're going to do a lot of push-ups, a lot of sit-ups. Um, so we're going to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. Um, and there will be some details that you may or may not remember about things we're going to cover. But overall, what we want to do this morning is just make you very self-conscious about your professional role. Um, and uh, your professional role as a lawyer. And how uh, your professional role as a public policy analyst uh, shares some skills with lawyering but also has some important differences, um, ethical differences, analytical differences. So, so we'll look at those things. Um, a couple of you are in my uh, methods course. You'll see a couple of slides here that also will appear in the methods course. And I, uh, as um, Lucy said, redundancy is good. So um, this morning, we're, this is going to be broken into three parts. The first part will be about thinking like a policy analyst and how that's different than thinking like a lawyer. Is there anyone here who's not from the law school or affiliated with the law school? So, so a lot of people. So that's, uh, so for some of you, um, you're not being trained to think like a lawyer, um, but I think the discussion will be very instructive uh, nevertheless, because the world of public policy is dominated by lawyers. And so uh, the clash between these thinking styles and, and uh, roles is important. Um, and then we're going to have a, a all too brief session on evidence quality and judging evidence quality. And it's such a vast topic that we're just going to really hit on some key themes um, and uh, things, things to look for. Because in the policy labs, you will be in real time, drowning in evidence that you will find obtained from clients, obtained from uh, uh, official records, um, interviews, and so on. Uh, and then we will end with a, a discussion of drawing inferences from evidence and some of the known pitfalls um, that, that you need to avoid when you do that. So. Um, Throughout this morning, we're going to talk about your professional role. And uh, I want you to be very self-conscious about, and I'm sure this is something you've all thought about a lot, but, but, but um, if you get a professional degree, you're taking on a role, and you're advertising that role. And that role conveys certain expectations to, to various audiences. And, um, uh, but when you're particularly working on public policy issues, there's a clash of different roles. And different people involved in the policy debate bring different roles. And each of those roles has different norms and expectations, different ideas about what's ethical or appropriate. And uh, so we, wanna, we want to um, uh, look at those. Now, um, public policy research is a um, is in a funny position. It shares elements with lawyering, but it shares elements with um, science, and particularly social science. Uh, most most of the policy labs deal with evidence and try to draw inferences from sometimes qualitative evidence, sometimes quantitative evidence. But in either case, trying to draw. Uh, conclusions about what's true in the world from, from the evidence. And um, so legal fact finding tries to do the same thing, right? Legal fact finding tries to find out what is true. And um, some of the things I say about lawyering today are going to be biased toward the American system. And I understand that um, people in this room are from many different countries, and your countries. Are, diff, may differ where they are on a continuum. Um, and the continuum in legal systems, there's a continuum spanning from inquisitorial systems to adversarial systems. Okay, so in an inquisitorial legal system, 
Um, and they're very few absolutely pure inquisitorial systems. But in an inquisitorial model, um, there's someone who's investigating the facts. They are supposed to be dispassionate and objective about looking at, at the facts. Um, they're not working for either side. And they uh, try to be as unbiased as possible and then present the results as objectively as, as possible to a third party decision maker who's going to render some sort of legal judgment. Um, under the adversarial model, um, each each disputant has their own representative. That representative is supposed to select evidence, um, find the evidence that's strongest for their client, and highlight and make salient the best evidence for their client. That's their job, and, and that's part of thinking like a lawyer. So what happens when you turn this into policy research? So under the inquisitorial model, uh, a, a policy lab operating on, under an inquisitorial model, you try to be as unbiased as possible at weighing all, collecting and weighing all the evidence with no thumbs on the scale. And you try to be an honest broker and lay out the facts and the issues and the trade-offs um, to help your audience, I, and in fact audiences, because one of the things we'll talk about is that policy analysis as multiple stakeholders and mul uh, multiple clients, in a way. Um, you could also approach a policy lab as an adversarial model. And under the adversarial model, you're trying to find whatever facts are most, effect are most persuasive to help the client get what the client wants. You're not trying to be unbiased. You're not trying to be balanced. Um, and that's approaching policy analysis like a lawyer. One of the things I'm going to argue this morning is that lawyering is very important, but it has its domain. And when that adversarial model bleeds into public policy analysis, it can distort the process. It can harm the credibility of the process. It can, um, it can lead to cynicism. And uh, it's not something you want to do sort of mindlessly to sort of back into a very adversarial approach to policy analysis. So I want you to really be thinking a lot about that. So policy analysis is not science, but it draws a lot on, on methods from science. And um, I've got a very lofty quote here about the authority of science from Francis Bacon. Science is but an image of the truth. Um, and uh, another quote making pretty much the same point about the authority of a scientist. Uh, Dr. Peter Venkman in the movie Ghostbusters, back off, man, I'm a scientist. Um, I've got a button that I bought in the 1980s that makes much the same point. <laughs> um, I'm really glad I saved this button because it seems very quaint today. Uh, because it, what, it reminds me that there was a time uh, when, I, when I was a graduate student, where we thought if we had the charts and graphs, we would have authority, right? We, it was like, you can't, you can't lay a finger on me. I've got the charts and graphs, and you don't, you know? And I very much believed I was getting that kind of authority. Uh, and I would be able to throw my weight around with all that authority. Um, you know, I didn't get a lab coat, but I but I had a PhD and, and I had lots of charts and graphs. Nobody believes the world is this simple anymore. Liz. How about the Excel button? No way. No way. I have a, 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 a high, high, high security special vault, um, which is mostly used for uh, national security uh, crises, but I put that in there. Um, because it's a treasured artifact. I've never seen another one. It's the only one I've ever seen. So. Um, so as you all know, we're in a very different world where everybody says they've got the charts and the graphs. And, and if you see a chart or a graph you don't like, you say, fake news. All right? Um, and um, so we're operating in a very difficult environment for policy analysis. <laughs> 
Um, I would not call this the golden age of policy analysis. I would say right now, this is an age for policy analysis where people who believe in the craft of policy analysis, it's like they're huddled around a tiny flame trying to guard it from very strong winds and make sure it doesn't go out. Um, and that's kind of where we're at. But this too shall pass. Um, this arrow, you know, the eras change and, um, and um, I'm expecting a renaissance of policy analysis. Um, it may happen later than, than I'd like it to happen, but just the, I mean, seriously, just the sheer number of students who've been showing up since we started to offer this class. It, it, it means a lot to us. I mean, it's, it's really interesting because when we started doing this, we didn't know if there would be any take up whatsoever, uh, any interest in policy analysis. Um, you know, people are um, getting high powered professional degrees and can go out and work in high paying jobs and um, a lot of those jobs don't require them to have any credential in public policy analysis. Um, and yet, on a Saturday morning, you know, people are devoting a Saturday morning. So, so it, it makes me think um, that flame is going to stay alive. I'm not talking like a drill sergeant at all. all right? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I mean, I almost had a tear there. <laughs> you know, that's, I'm not good at this drill sergeant thing. So, okay. So, so why don't we use an adversarial mode for um, uh, uh, when we're using empirical evidence? Um, there are a lot of arguments for why actually the adversarial mode is a very effective means of disputing in legal disputes. There are counter arguments, there are problems with it, but there are a lot of strengths to it. But here I just want to point out that there's some disanalogies between legal disputes and fac factual disputes about truth um, that make the adversarial approach undesirable. And the first one is, um, I think the most important one, which is, yes, lawyers present a very selective, biased view of the best evidence for their case, but everyone involved in the process knows that they're going to do that and that that is their job. So there's no deception going on. Everyone knows that their job is to be a, a ferocious advocate for their client, okay? So that explicit role is important. If someone, on the other hand, claims, you know, I'm neutral, I'm a scientist, um, uh, my, my, view, my own personal views never enter into the equation, and then they put a thumb on the scale, they're deceiving people, um, they're misleading people, and uh, they're trying to get the benefits of, of one role, um, but play by the rules of the other role. Uh, in, in legal disputes, there are usually two sides represented. In a lot of public policy debates, almost all the professional stakeholders um, sometimes are all on one side of the issue, or they're massive imbalances in the, in the power of the um, of, the, of the sides. Of course, that happens in legal disputes sometimes too, but uh, in legal disputes, there's an explicit standard of proof. Um, you know, one of my research interests is when you instruct jurors and in, that they need to be certain beyond a reasonable doubt, do they actually understand what that means? What does that mean to them? But, but at least the law has given a lot of thought to how much evidence do you need before you um, uh, change your mind? Uh, when we're dealing with evidence of the real world, it's not, it's not really clear that there's a shared burden of proof of which side holds the burden of proof, how strong the standard is. Is it clear and convincing evidence or mere preponderance of evidence or is it something like beyond a reasonable doubt? There's no explicit standard proof. Um, in legal cases, there's an explicit third party decision maker. Um, uh, who, by the way, has to make a decision because the parties need closure. You know, whether right or wrong, we're going to decide by the end of this dispute. Uh, in public policy disputes, it's not clear who the decider is. There are a whole bunch of different deciders. There may be a president, but there are senators and congressmen and, and governors and, and mayors and 
Um, so there are lots of different decision makers making decisions. Um, and then finally, usually in a legal case, uh, what, if the two sides disagree, usually one of the sides is closer to whatever the truth is. Um, not invariably, but usually. Uh, in scientific practice, if we look at the history of scientific practice, when people are arguing about evidence, um, it's quite often um, both sides are completely wrong. And there's some third position that neither of them have considered that years later people will look back and say, they're arguing about the wrong thing. So public policy analysts are trying to draw, trying to define a role for themselves, because it's, it's a fairly new profession, and trying to figure out where do, where do, where do they fit in this, um, in this table. And um, some people who are trained as lawyers just approach it as another lawyering task. Other people who are trained as social scientists approach it more like a social science task. Um, now, uh, years ago, uh, Dave Weimer, and I forget Vining's first name, uh, argued that professional policy analysis, analysts tend to adopt one of three different roles. And um, this is something, this is a great time for you to be thinking about this quarter, for those of you who are in a policy lab, which of these describes the way you're going to approach your work in this task? Um, and by the way, the authors don't suggest that one of these is the correct one and the others are the wrong one. They just call attention to them. So the objective technician role is we're just going to do the analysis. The numbers will speak for themselves. Um, we'll keep our distance from the clients. We will identify the trade-offs, but we'll let the client make the trade-offs. Okay? So we tell, we tell them for each of a number of policy options, what are the good things that would follow from this intervention, what are the bad things, and we let them decide. Um, I worked for seven years in the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica as a professional policy an analyst. I would say this probably characterizes the Rand view of public policy analysis. Um, the, in fact, keep distance from clients it's really well illustrated by Rand. Rand was located in Santa Monica because all the clients were in the Washington, D.C. Beltway. And Rand wanted to be as far as, I mean, there was an explicit decision uh, when Rand was started after World War II to, to locate it as far away from the Beltway as possible because there was a strong sense that if you really wanted independent policy analysis, um, people couldn't be part of that. Wonderful, wonderful community of, of the Washington, D.C. Beltway. Um, clients advocate. I, I, I think what I've noticed in the past, a lot of policy labs have just sort of backed into the client's advocate mode. Um, some professors view it that way. Um, and, uh, and again, there's, there's nothing right or wrong about this. But the idea of the client's advocate is you're doing much as with lawyering. You're hired by a client. You're, um, you're, you're working for a client. And you try to give them whatever they need to succeed. Um, and um, you may try to influence their thinking but you try to help them do what, they, what it is they want to do as effectively as possible. And some of the policy labs are like this. I would say every policy lab has some element of this. Um, but I do want to distinguish it from, because it's easy to blur the lines here, from an issue advocate position. Um, in an issue advocate position, you may have a client but who is a named person, often a public official or, or someone in an NGO. But you also have another client that's not sitting at the table, and that other client is the public. Okay? And you're trying to represent the public interest. And, um, um, and um, people who take an issue advocacy professional stance are very selective about the projects they work on. Because they have certain commitments to certain issues, and they, they want to um, work on issues that they think favor the public good. And um, 
the um, uh, issue advocates uh, are not, the difference between issue advocacy and lawyering can be a little blurry, but issue advocates and public policy um, should be more forthcoming about the limitations of data, even if it favors a point they want. Because part of their role is they're trying to um, still be an honest broker like the objective tech technician. Um, so uh, think about these roles over the course of, of, uh, of your policy lab. Um, try them on for sides. Uh, uh, you learn something about yourself and, and what you resonate with. But it's really good to be very self-conscious about wh what is my role here, um, how have I chosen to define my role, and not, um, not blur those lines and sort of lose track of, um, and, for, and in particular, not jump back and forth between the three roles, depending on whichever one today is going to be um, most persuasive to someone else. So um, I have, in my career, worked uh, on lots of different public policy issues. Uh, but I have a, somehow I seem to have a taste for hot button, heavily politicized topics. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, neither of these topics seem all that politicized anymore, which is a miracle. Uh, because there were, these, these topics were so emotionally charged for so many years. Um, uh, so I, I worked for 17 years on the, um, uh, for the Department of Defense uh, uh, at, at, as a project for the Department of Defense, first in the Obama, uh, Clinton administration and then uh, some years later for the Obama administration on the question of uh, military personnel policy and, and uh, should uh, gays and lesbians be allowed to serve uh, openly without concealing their sexual orientation. I'm sure you're all familiar with that debate. Um, and that, that very long 17 year period ended with a repeal of the don't ask, don't tell policy, but it, 17 years is a long time. A lot of flights to Washington. And um, uh, I've also worked for years on the question of what would happen if we legalized various psychoactive drugs that are currently prohibited. And um, in both these cases, um, we were uh, thin on data. There's not a lot known empirically about some of these questions. Um, and very strong passions on both sides. And as a policy analyst, it was, if I wanted, if I wanted to preach to the choir, there's certain kind of pieces I could write. Uh, during, during much of this time, I had left Rand and I was a professor at UC Berkeley. Now, without stereotyping too badly. Um, if you think about UC Berkeley, what were the professional risks to me of, of advocating that gays and lesbians serve openly in the military at Berkeley? How risky would that be for me to take that stance? Not, not, not too much uh, courage would be required. Um, uh, you know, announcing that I favor legalizing psychoactive drugs. At UC Berkeley, I probably would have been canonized. Um, so, so I don't want to say that I was under, um, that my job was on the line. And if I just wanted to make people at UC Berkeley happy, there's, I, could, I could have written all sorts of impassioned things that would have, they would just eat up. But I, I was trying to help decision makers make actual decisions and understanding that the decision makers were in an entirely different political environment than Berkeley. And um, 
And so I had to work really hard in both these domains to be seen as an honest broker by both sides if I was going to have any impact at all. Um, my playing the honest broker role was enormously frustrating to a lot of other people who didn't, who didn't want me to play that role. Um, um, I could have gone to more parties with celebrities, uh, uh, particularly in the drug area, uh, if I had, if I had um, been more of an advocate and less of an analyst. Um, and um, I can't tell you how, in both issues how many times over the years I had people come up to me and say, what do you really think? What do you really think? Um, and there was always a sense that I must have a real view. Did, do I have views about these issues? Did I have views about these issues? Yes, I actually did as a citizen, and that's, that's problematic. That was problematic for me. Um, for the gays in the military issue, not purely as on, 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 on moral and ethical principles, I thought, of course, they should be able to serve openly. And there was just no doubt in my mind about that. Um, but we were not tasked with weighing in on the moral questions or the ethical questions. We were specifically tasked um, by the Secretary of Defense with asking whether the, the military could change the personnel policy in a manner consistent with their standards of unit cohesion and military effectiveness. So that's an empirical question. If you change the policy, do you change unit cohesion and military effectiveness? Um, the, um, so because I had to deal with a lot of these hot button issues, back in 1998, I wrote my first piece on um, biases that creep in when people use research evidence. And we've, we've uh, circulated that to you all. Um, since 1998, there's, there, there's now an enormous literature on this topic. And, uh, and it's actually very exciting, because there, there, there are some big changes afoot in how people use research evidence to try to deal with some of these problems. Um, and I um, apologize to a couple of you who heard me talk about this just two days ago. Um, but uh, in, in the paper, I distinguish between different ways in which people can be biased when they're using research evidence. And all of these are going to be issues in your policy lab. So there are three columns here. The first column refers to, are you intentionally being biased? Are you trying to, to put forth a biased view of the evidence? In other words, if you know that there's some evidence that favors one side and other evidence that favors another, are you intentionally trying to hide the unfavorable evidence, obscure it, and promote the favorable evidence? Um, the second column, it's possible that you're not at all intending to be biased. But what I mean by motivated here is that there's one of the two answers. It's an answer you would like to be true. You're hoping it comes out one way. Um, and then the third column is, is this a situation in which there's actually a normative justification for being biased? Um, and we referred to one normative justification in, in, in lawyering in an adversarial legal system. The system justifies you acting in a biased way within certain ethical guidelines. Um, uh, and and there, are, there are some other areas where there may be justifiable bias. Um, so now we have um, five types of bias. Um, and you may see all five over the course of your policy lab. Uh, hopefully you won't run into any fraud. But fraud is outright intentional misrepresentation of evidence. Um, and uh, I'm not going to say much about fraud today, but fraud is enormously corrosive to the system because the whole system of persuading through evidence 
is built on a certain amount of trust. We can't possibly go and vet every piece of evidence that we encounter. And we have to, at some point, be willing to trust that people are being straight with us. Uh, so fraud is incredibly damaging. It is also much easier to get caught being fraudulent today than ever before. Um, it is becoming really easy to catch people plagiarizing. It's becoming really easy to catch people um, fabricating data. There are all these new forensic statistical methods. Uh, graduate students somewhere in the other part of the country can pull your policy analysis, if it has some empirical analysis, they can pull it down and they can use some off-the-shelf algorithms and they can check and see whether there's high degree of suspicion that you um, played fast and loose with the numbers. Um, so the good news is I think we're going to see less fraud because it's going to be harder to get away with fraud. Um, but, um, you know, the bad news is one of the things that's happening in my field, psychology, is a lot of highly respected senior figures are now turning out to have made their name doing some questionable things with their data. And, and a lot of reputations have, have fallen and should fall. Um, advocacy, um, you're intentionally being biased on behalf of your client. Um, you want them to win. Uh, it's, I say it's justifiable, maybe. It's clearly justifiable in the, in the legal context in an adversarial legal system. It's less clear that it's justifiable if you're pretending that you're an objective technician when you're really this kind of motivated advocate. Cold bias and hot bias. This is a temperature metaphor that psychologists use to distinguish between being biased because of our passions and emotions, that's a hot bias, versus being biased just because of the way our brain processes information. Um, and in the article, I talk about examples of, of both of those. And a key point about both of these is we used to think um, that, that most important high-level cognition happened above the lo level of awareness so that people would actually monitor their own decision-making processes. And that meant, if that were true, that if you're determined I'm going to be an honest broker, um, you can scrutinize. You can be vigilant for any sign of bias in your own decision making and stomp it out the moment it comes up. But what, we're, what we've come to understand is um, the part of our brain that's actually conscious of our decision making is just the tip of the iceberg and barel, is barely aware of most of what's going on cognitively in the whole cognitive system, which means um, that there's no conscious, there's no watchdogs um, sitting and observing everything in the brain that can catch everything that's going on. There's, there's implicit bias, and we see this with implicit measures of racism and sexism, but the same issue comes up with bias toward evidence. Um, skepticism, skepticism in, in the article is the idea that it may be justified in some domains to hold one proposition to a higher standard of evidence than another one. Um, and you know, an example would be, uh, you know, many scientists feel that evidence that purports to support mental telepathy, mind reading at a distance, um, should be held to an extremely high standard of scrutiny. Because if it were true that minds could read other minds at a distance, it would run counter to so many other things we believe about about brains and about physics, and um, physics is, is so out there that actually, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even sure physics rules out <laughs> telepathy anymore, but, um, but uh, uh, okay, so these are these bias prototypes. No. Okay, so I wanna talk, uh, here's an example of um, a, a, a biased, um, called confirmation bias. I'm guessing a lot of you have heard of it before. Um, a lot of you will be evaluating interventions in the world, maybe an NGO's intervention, probably more likely some government intervention, maybe a, a new law or um, some new policy or rule or regulation. And you will try to look for evidence that didn't have the effect it wanted. And our brains 
seem to um, just naturally drift toward a particular style of evidence gathering here, uh, which is when we want to show that an intervention works, we start looking for, we start with examples where the intervention took place, and then we see, did it work? And we collect examples of it working, right? And we count those up. And if you could come up with a whole lot of examples, you say, look at all the places it worked. So therefore, the evidence must be strong. Now, what's wrong with this? How could you be led to bad inferences by this? Yeah, so you've got three other cells there, right? So um, if, you know, if, if I believe in astrology and I believe that Scorpios are hostile, and I give you a whole bunch of examples of hostile scorpions, um, Scorpio is a birth sign in the, in the, the Western form of um, uh, astrology. Um, well, it, if you really want to test that hypothesis, you need to look and see all those scorpions that I listed. Are there examples of them not being hostile? And, and almost certainly there will be. Um, and then you still have 11 other earth signs in the zodiac system, in the astrology system, right? Are none of the other 11 hostile? So you need to establish what's the base rate for hostility among non-scorpions. And, and in fact, if you collect data on all four of these cells systematically, there are statistical methods of actually checking to see whether it, there is a pattern of association or, or whether it's just chance variation. Um, but we don't naturally tend to do this. We tend to just look for evidence in, in one cell. Um, now, people uh, working, most professionals working with data, um, don't completely ignore negative evidence or evidence that runs counter to a contrary, to, runs counter to their, their hypothesis. You know, sophisticated professionals know they're going to get confronted on this. Um, so it's not that they completely ignore evidence for the other side. Um, but we know that one of the things we've learned is that people, when work, working with evidence, they're much tougher on negative evidence than they are on positive evidence. So if you find some fact that seems to help your side in a political debate, you don't scrutinize it very hard. You don't really try to think through all the reasons why it could be BS um, uh, or why someone could be lying. You just seize on it. Um, when you come across a fact that supports the other side, you take out the long knives. You know, you just, you, you, you all have developed really scary ability to tear apart other people's arguments and you use all your best uh, skills there to tear down the argument. So it's not like we're, uh, we're always tough with evidence. We're differentially tough with evidence depending on whether we like it or not. And that's um, kind of a form of warm cognition because we're being tough, but our, our emotion is allowing us to choose when to be tough and when not to be tough. And this is, a, this is something I, I see all the time um, in students working on empirical projects. And, and they probably see it in me when they read my papers, because I'm vulnerable to all of these biases as well. Gene Bardak is a, Gene Bardak is a mensch. He's, um, he's a wonderful, uh, sweet guy in, in Berkeley, California, who um, he's having a dinner party pretty much Every night of the week, everyone who travels through Berkeley goes and has. Uh, so show up at his house sometime. Just say, <laughs> Rob told me I could have dinner here. Um, right here. Yeah. It's on reserve in the library, the latest edition. And So this book. Um, uh, at least the version I have here is fourth edition. I don't know what they're up to, but um, the, uh, I have all the different editions. The, but the first edition was um, 
was just photocopies of a typed manuscript that were um, for, that he used in his teaching and, and got circulated to public policy schools across the country. And pretty soon everybody was giving uh, copies of this to, to their students. So we finally found a publisher. And um, the first version was called The Eightfold Path to uh, Policy Analysis. Um, someone decided that might be offensive to Buddhists. Um, and they, they took away The Eightfold Path for a while. Uh, and then after, after a while, he um, put it back in. Either Buddha signed off on it, or he just decided, I'm going with it. Um, uh, but the idea of this book is, is so simple that you will, if, when you look at this, you'll almost feel like, did I really need to even look at this? Because everything will look so obvious to you. So I'm going to ask you to take my word for it, that of these eight steps he goes through, I, students who haven't read this almost always miss at least four of the steps. I mean, just completely jump over steps. Um, so what seems obvious to you actually does not describe the way people work with evidence. So I'm not going to go over the whole thing. It's a quick read. Um, uh, read the book. Uh, the Wikipedia entry is almost as long as the book, um, and because it's such a short book. And um, but so, Bardex procedure for doing policy analysis is eight steps: define the problem, assemble some evidence, construct the alternatives, select the criteria, project the outcomes, confront the trade-offs. Decide, tell your story. Um, and uh, I, see, I see students skip many of these steps. Defining the problem seems so obvious, uh, but I've worked with students here at Stanford who have been working for weeks uh, on a topic, and then they ask to come and see me, and I ask them to define the problem, and it's clear that the the students in the room don't have the same problem definition. Uh, and they don't, haven't noticed that before because they've never had to define the problem. Um, and uh, assembling some evidence, nobody skips that. That one's people do. Um, construct the alternatives. Um, remember in our two by two table of um, you know, Scorpios are hostile, you look in all those cells. In the same way when you're doing policy analysis, it's hard to do good policy analysis by only taking a single proposition, a single intervention, and evaluating it yes, no. It's much easier to offer insight by making comparisons across different alternatives. The status quo might be an alternative. Um, a slight variation on what's being proposed might be an alternative. But com comparison across alternatives is very illuminating, and it's something you don't want to miss. Um, uh, select the criteria is another issue where students often will start gathering evidence and sort of ranking policy alternatives based on some criterion without really having thought about what is the right criterion. And a lot of times they will choose as their criterion whatever data they have available to them. And so they'll let the data define the criterion. Um, so I'll, get, I'll give you some examples in a minute of, of the problem of selecting criteria. Um, so let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, defining the problem. For years, uh, if you actually look at the rhetoric coming out of the White House Office of National Do Drug Control Policy, they say they're attacking drug problems. But when you see how they actually operationalize that, it's, it was table after table of Prevalence statistics. Prevalence statistics are measures of how many people are using drugs. So in essence, they were defining the problem as we have too many people that use drugs. Um, and uh, that is one criterion for drug policy. You, you, you may set as your criterion, we want to reduce the number of people can, um, uh, 
using drugs. But for, there are a whole variety of reasons why that's actually a very short-sighted way of thinking about drug policy. And, and in a piece in 1998, I argued that national drug control policy needs to make a distinction between reducing prevalence, the number of people using drugs, quantity, reducing the amount of drugs people use, that's very different than the number of people who use. Because, in fact, um, for, you, know, you take a drug like marijuana, a very large number of people um, have used marijuana in the past 12 months. Um, uh, the, the, the quantity of marijuana they've consumed varies enormously. It's this very skewed distribution where um, a lot of people have just used a little bit of marijuana and then there are so-called wake and bake users who, as soon as they get up in the morning, they start getting high and they stay high the, the whole day. Um, and then when you look at harms, why do we actually care about whether they're using drugs? Well, you know, when you push people, why do you care about that? It's usually because they worry about um, uh, traffic safety, good parenting, um, uh, 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 income generating crime, things that they think are linked to drugs. If you looked in the Office of National Drug Control annual report, they wouldn't have statistics on any of these problems. They weren't tracking the problems, they were just tracking the number of people using. Um, uh, so I was trying to redefine the problem. Uh, I had my critics. Critics said, oh, well your problem definition is problematic too. Uh, and they nailed me on it. They, they said, um, you, your entire framework uh, is based on harms and you never mentioned benefits, that there could be any benefits of drug use. And I was like, I went back, read my own writing, I was like, yeah, busted, you're right, you're right. Um, uh, so problem definition is important. Uh, construct the alternatives. Um, even if the client brings you a single alternative, you can, you'll find your analysis going more smoothly and getting more traction and, and um, uh, more energy when you, bring, when you create some alternatives uh, to consider. Um, the status quo is always a possible alternative, just do nothing. Um, or do, you know, just do less of what we're currently doing. Um, people often look at best practices. I put best practices in scare quotes. Best practices is this term that you hear in the policy world for there's someone out there doing something that we think is best practice. I actually hate this term, and I hate this term because uh, if we actually had evidence that a place was, uh, some organization was doing something effectively, we never say best practice when we actually have evidence. We just say this program works. Whenever, whenever people say best practice, it's when they have no evidence that it's actually good. Almost in every case where you see a list of best practices, if you trace down the origin of that list, you will find that the people who were involved in compiling the list created those best practices. So it's a very, I want you to just be allergic to that term. Try not to use it yourself. And um, uh, this is my little, I'll get off my soapbox now, but. Um, um, okay, selecting the criteria by which you evaluate Alternatives, your client may give you the criteria that matter. Um, they may have very definite criteria in mind. Sometimes they only explicitly state one, but the conversations with them, it's clear that they're also importing other criteria. And it's your job to bring those out in the open and make them expli explicit. So, um, you know, the Pentagon viewed the gays of the military issue as one of military effectiveness would units still be able to perform effectively if gays and lesbians served openly? So that was their criterion, was, was military effectiveness. Um, certainly other American citizens had other criteria they cared about, like, um, like, like uh, fairness. Um, you will find that some of your criteria are very easy to measure, and so it's really easy to give all your attention to those just because they're easy to measure. But you don't overlook the other criteria. Just because it's difficult to measure something like fairness doesn't mean that fairness isn't crucially important to stakeholders in a debate. And um, so you may end up in a situation with an asymmetry where 
some of your criteria have quantitative measures and others have indirect qualitative measures. You can't directly algorithmically combine those in a mathematical way. Um, well, so much the worse for mathematics. Doesn't mean you ignore the non-quantified things. It just, needs, it just means you need to take care in, in balancing those non-quantitative uh, criteria. There's a saying, the law of the hammer, you give a little boy a hammer and suddenly everything needs hammering. You see this a lot with professional social scientists and policy analysts. They have one particular tool that they're really good at. Um, see this a lot with econometricians. There's some particular tool that they're really good at. And so they tr they, any problem they tackle, they, they try to use that tool as the way of tackling it. And a lot of times it's just driven by, they've got the tool, where is there a policy controversy that involve, where I could use this tool? And um, it's great that they're using those tools, but it can be very distorting because they're just focusing on where the, the data are rather than where the, where the questions are. <clears throat> um, the most important thing uh, that, that people have taken from Gene Bardak's book um, uh, is um, confronting the trade-offs. And, um, and for me, this is what really distinguishes um, analysts from activists working on public policy issues. And this is not a value statement that um, analysts are better than activists, but um, analysts, uh, most policy analysts, professional policy analysts, have been tra trained to lay out the trade-offs, and the trade-offs usually means that one alternative dominates another one on one criteria, but the situation is reversed for a different criterion. So we can either choose option A and maximize efficiency, or we can choose B and maximize perceived fairness. Um, but we, we, you know, there's a choice there. And um, that makes delivering your policy analysis message very uncomfortable, because that's not what audiences want to hear. They don't want to be made uncomfortable. They want you to make the problem easy for them, not, not make it harder for them. Um, but that's part of, part of your job. So um, I'm going to just give you uh, a couple of excerpts from a uh, recent policy analysis, just to illustrate a few of these points. And this was um, after marijuana was legalized at the state level uh, in California. Um, the California legislature was faced with the, the challenge of trying to integrate the new, this was a ballot initiative, so it was not written by, in Sacramento by legislators, it was written by um, the people who, um, the advocates who uh, launched the initiative. And they had to reconcile it with existing marijuana laws, including a fairly recent medical marijuana uh, law, which itself was a significant reform in California marijuana law. So, um, so my students um, uh, tried to help the California Assembly think through this task. And, um, and these are some of the slides from their, their briefing. Um, so they went to Sacramento and gave a brief briefing um, that was well attended and I'm told influential. Um, so one of the topics they tackled was um, how should California um, operationalize impaired driving under the influence of marijuana under this new law? And how should they test it? And so they, they gathered a lot of evidence about different testing technologies and their implications. And so what you see here in this table is here they have three alternatives. This is just one subpart of their analysis, but they have three alternatives. So the alternatives are rows. And you can see the columns are, are uh, criteria. How, how effective is this alternative at measuring impair, impairment, cognitive impairment, perceptual impairment? Calibration is a question of whether the numbers that come out of the measuring device um, are reliable enough so you can compare numbers across two different arrestees and it means the same thing in each case. Um, Funding and budget, how expensive would it be to implement? 
how accurate, and that itself turns out to be complicated because accuracy is not a single dimension, but it's really, there are two criteria. There's um, minimizing false positives and minimizing false negatives. So you can have a, a test that's very good at catching people who really are marijuana impaired, but it will also accuse a bunch of other people who haven't used marijuana of being marijuana impaired. Or you could have a test that almost never falsely accuses anyone, but also never catches the people who do it. So, um, and then ease of administration. And you know, what you see here is, you know, some of the, those criteria are not uh, commensurable. They're not all on the same quantitative metric. Um, but what, they've, what they're doing here, and this is not science, uh, and it's not engineering, but it's disciplined. Um, what they're doing is they're using pluses and minuses. And you see here they're using green and red. So a mix of metaphors, but green light and red light. So very effectively, at a glance, you can see the trade-offs involved. Um, the, uh, the two most accurate measures, saliva testing and blood testing, um, are um, uh, uh, each have downsides. Saliva testing uh, is very expensive, and blood testing is very difficult to administer on a, in, at, at a roadside. It's easy to do in a lab. But, um, um, here's another example. Uh, this one's quite old, but it's from uh, a public policy textbook. Uh, policy alternatives for addressing kidney shortage. And you, here they flip the rows and the columns. So here the alternatives um, are maintain current policy, use a brokered auction, expanded reimbursement with relative listing, purchase with demand side chain auctions. Um, I don't even remember the details of what these actually are. I read it years ago. Um, to actually plunge into the analysis, you have to learn about all these things. But, but I just want to show it to you because they've, it's a, a nice example of um, weighing in on these alternatives with respect to five different criteria that policymakers might care of. And here, just with short phrases, they're identifying the trade-offs. Um, that these, these different policy options um, have different rankings on different criteria. And they don't tell the policymaker how to rank those criteria. They just say, here are the trade-offs that you're going to have to confront. OK. So we've talked about thinking like, like a policy analyst. Now we want to talk about actually about what does quality control mean when we're processing evidence? How do we know we're doing a good job? And um, I'm going to, um, a lot of my work is quantitative. Uh, and I will talk about quantitative research. But everything I'm talking about applies to the full spectrum of different forms of evidence, including qualitative evidence as well as quantitative evidence, ranging from evidence that comes directly from what human beings say to each other like in interviews or surveys. Or some of you will be studying evidence that's not directly generated by people at all. It may be, um, you may be counting hospital beds or, or, or um, the behavior of machines or um, the behavior of uh, um, some surgical device or you know, any number of things. Um, but these principles are going to really apply in all these different cases. Um, and again, this is something some of you have heard of from me. This is a key point in my research design class. The whole class, in a way, uh, boils down to a distinction between two problems that we try to solve in research design, reducing noise and reducing bias. And noise is random error in our data. Random could, from, yeah, I mean, you could take a perspective of, of physics, uh, quantum physics, and you could say um, that to say that there's random noise in, in data is some uh, inextricable randomness at the quantum level 
Um, we have nothing so highfalutin in mind here. We really just have the idea of, in policy analysis, what we're calling noise are sources of, of variation that we can't directly control or measure that are influencing our measures. Um, and it, it could be, you know, when you take a standardized test, uh, we're using it as an indicator of your aptitude according to what that test is supposed to measure. But it's also tapping into the ambient noise in the room the day you took the test. Was there a jackhammer breaking up concrete outside the window that was interfering with your performance? Did you fail to get enough sleep? Did you drink too much coffee and you're just too wired? Um, yeah, all those things are noise for the purpose of the analysis because if we don't know how to control for those and take those out of the score somehow, subtract those from the score, they're going to um, distort the score. Um, but the important thing with noise is it's just it's random. It's not systematically correlated with the things we're trying to measure. Um, and noise is it's easy to see the problem of noise in social science, which is why a lot of people will kind of sneer at social science. They'll say social science, right? Uh, and that's like, uh, you know, what, the pretense that you could have such a thing as social science. And when you press someone on that, you know, why the scare quotes? Why are you saying it? They'll say, well, look, of course, you can't measure things with any kind of reliability in the social sciences. It's just going to be incredibly noisy, which is true. That turns out to be the easy problem to solve. We won't talk a lot about that today, but actually we know how to manage noise. We're very good at that. We've been good at that for, for decades. Um, and the simple way to manage noise is aggregation. Um, because if noise is random, it's going to lead to departures from a true score either too low or too high from the true score. And if you aggregate across enough measures, those errors will cancel out. Some random error that comes up with too low of an estimate will be canceled out by another random error. And randomness gets, uh, random errors get canceled out by aggregation. And you can have an incredibly noisy questionnaire. But if you ask it of enough people and it's truly just random error, you can come up with very, very good predictions despite that error. Bias is the big problem of social science. It's, it's the problem we spend most of our time dealing with. And bias, it's not just there's error in the data. The error is in a particular direction. The, the error is in a direction that favors one hypothesis over another. Um, and in the worst case, we don't, we don't even know which direction it is. We know that there's bias, but we're not sure which direction the bias is. Um, Biases can sometimes cancel out. So if you have a heterogeneity of different sources of evidence and they each have a bias, if those biases are different, that can increase your confidence in your judgment. So for example, if your policy lab team finds some evidence from a left of center political group, uh, some a data source, and then you find another report from a right of center political group that measured the same thing, maybe their own survey, and they converge despite different biases. Um, uh, maybe one of them is a little too extreme in one direction and one's too extreme. But somewhere, somewhere in the middle is that the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. And so they're at least bounding the disagreement. The problem is when we all our sources of evidence are correlated. So common thing in policy labs all your sources of evidence are from the same industry, from, from participants in the industry who have a shared stake in the policy decisions that are being made and are in that industry with a shared goal, um, profitability or, or whatever the goal is. Um, and when you have homogeneity of sources, you have problems with evidence. And this extends to homogeneity of researchers. So an enormous problem in the social sciences is if you reach into a big bag and pull out a social scientist, 
they're going to look like me. Um, they're going to uh, be an older white male, disproportionately. Okay, so now if we were really like Dr. Peter Venkman and Ghostbusters, back off, I'm a scientist. You know, I'm, I, you know this truth just, emer just passes through me. I'm just a channel that the truth speaks. If, if, that's, if it were that, it wouldn't matter if we're all white males. Um, but of course, the concern we have to have is maybe being white or being male or being American, North American, um, affects the way I evaluate evidence. And if other people working on this topic share those same characteristics, they're not going to keep me honest because they have the same bias. And we're all going to feel really good when we agree. Um, but maybe we're all agreeing because we all have the same biases. So the heterogeneity of a research community is really quite important. Um, uh, heterogeneity of researchers, but also heterogeneity of sources. Um, and in general, what we want to look for is triangulation across biased methods. If we can identify a bias, sometimes we can correct for it or adjust for it. If we can't explicitly identify the magnitude of the bias, it's very hard to correct for it. Um, but awareness is, awareness is the first key. And being honest about the biases in your analysis is part of that. Telling the reader, look, our results really seem to lean toward a particular conclusion. The reader should understand that our methodology and our sources of evidence have some biases that maybe favor that point of view. And the reader needs to take that into account. So part of your professional duty is to, to warn the reader of that. OK, just to make sure you understand the concepts. No cheating if you've done this before. OK, here are four targets. Um, and an archer has, has um, uh, hit the target three times with three arrows. So I want you to look at these and say, which, which of the targets constitutes low noise and low bias? How many people say A? B? C? C? OK, B is low noise and low bias. It's low noise because the dots are close to each other. If you think of these three shots as three independent tests of the person's ability, the fact that you keep coming up with the shots being very close to each other, say that this is a pretty reliable measure of this person's ability. And the more three is not very many, but if you, you had dozens and dozens of shots and they kept coming really close to each other, you would say, um, you know, there's a very reliable measure of people's ability. We, we say it's not biased because not only are the, the three dots together, but they're all um, on center, right? Is there an example? Which example would be low noise but high bias? A, B, C, or D? D. OK, so you see D. Again, the dots are really close together, so it's a very reliable measure. But this person is consistently off target in a particular direction. This is actually, I told somebody the other day, this is, it was actually me as a graduate student in a local pub playing darts, uh, <laughs> which was something I did a lot as a graduate student, uh, playing darts and, and feeling guilty because I wasn't studying because I was playing darts. And I. It's not just that I would miss the center of the target. I would reliably miss the center of the target. And I would reliably miss it in a particular direction, which is incredibly frustrating, because it meant that some part of my brain actually has some cognitive control over hitting a certain spot. I just haven't figured out what part of my brain can move that spot down two inches, you know? Um, and I could never figure it out. Um, again, it's because it's, not, it's below my level of conscious awareness. And it, uh, so, so anyway, and yeah, just to finish off the diagram, you'll see that in cases A and B, you have low reliability. So the dots are farther apart from each other. 
But a key difference is in A, those dots surround the true, the true score, the center of the target. Whereas in C, they're off target. And one of the things I want you to notice about A, I asserted that noise is a manageable problem. And I want you to just imagine taking the average of those three shots in number A there, and you'll see that the average is going to be right in the center of the target. It's just noisy. So this, this is someone who's, who is fairly skilled at aiming center, but not skilled enough to, to bring in the tails of that statistical distribution and tighten it up. Um, and with practice, this person could eventually tighten it up and tighten it and tighten it, but they're off to a very good start because they're, uh, they're unbiased. Now, uh, so I've suggested that reliability or reducing noise is easier than validity or reducing bias. And reliability and validity, those words are sometimes used interchangeably, but I want to suggest they're actually two very different concepts of quality control, and both are important. Reliability is absence of noise. Validity is absence of bias. Um, the, um, and I've, as I said, aggregation is our best solution for dealing with noise, for increasing reliability. Larger samples of just about anything. So this is very clear in the mathematics of survey sample size. The larger the sample you have, the more precise the survey projections will be. Um, and people have not evolved, our brains have not evolved to have real good intuitions about how sample size works. Um, and so most people feel that, um, you know, the size of a political survey is a direct indicator of its quality. Um, but it, there's actually a nonlinear relationship in aggregation between size and quality, which is that at very low levels of n, of the sample size, there's huge payoff of increasing your sample size. But at asymptotes, when, and you reach a certain point at which it no longer, you know, the marginal gain of adding more cases isn't that great. So there's huge benefits to increasing your sample size for very small samples. If you already have a very large sample, it's, it's not necessarily a good use of your resources to just, actually, anecdote. Um, so in 20, 2009, I guess it was, as part of this Pentagon uh, process of looking at the gays in the military issue, uh, people in the Pentagon decided they were going to do a survey and actually ask um, active military personnel how they felt about the issue. This is basically unprecedented. The military does not ask their personnel whether they like their orders. Um, this is, so this was, this was, I mean, this was bizarre in its face because it's just not part of military culture. The other thing that was kind of astonishing was they, they surveyed 40, 50,000 people, um, which from a statistical standpoint is just preposterous. As long as it's true random sampling, uh, they just, they needed a tenth of that, um, e even less. In fact, it's very counterintuitive, but the size of this, if we wanted to reliably describe the percentage of um, uh, Liz Warren supporters in Palo Alto, the sample size we would need to describe support for Liz Warren in Palo Alto is actually about the same sample size you would need to describe adults in the entire United States. So what I'm telling you is the size of the population actually has very little to do with the size of the sample you need. Um, it, uh, it, it's, um, we tend to think larger populations need larger samples, but it, just because of the nonlinear mathematics of sample size, it's not really true. Um, but there's a huge difference between if we only talked to 50 people in Palo Alto versus 300 people in Palo Alto. Um, uh, now, I'm talking about sample size, but this is, this is aggregation in everything you do. So, the number of different articles that you, you search for in Google Scholar when you're researching your topic in a policy lab is part of aggregation. And it's part of aggregation because each of those articles is going to be a flawed source of evidence and you're, trying, you're hoping that some of those flaws will cancel out by looking at lots of sources of evidence. 
if you're doing a survey, if you're writing a survey questionnaire, the number of questions you ask about a topic um, can increase your reliability. So asking only a single question about someone's attitude toward a particular policy intervention is a very noisy way of measuring it. Asking five questions about it and averaging across those will be much less noisy. There are trade-offs. People are unwilling to answer infinite questions and they, and they get bored and, and, you, uh, and you have other things you want to ask. And so we can't always ask as many questions as we'd like. Um, but if we ask something more than one way, we in increase our reliability. Any questions about that? Um, now, how many people have taken a statistics class? OK, so some of you, don't worry about it if you haven't. Um, what you're seeing here, these are statistical distributions. The word density here just means um, of all the people in the population or all the units that are being measured, how many of them are at each value of the thing you're trying to measure. And you'll see in these distributions that there's some peak density that is the most common point in the distribution. If in these cases they're symmetrical, so if you took sort of a mirror image of the left and right side, it would be about the same. So they, these are symmetrical distributions. Statistically, that, that means that the, the mean and the median and the mode are all going to align, um, which is not true in a lot of public policy topics. Um, I got it. Um, a lot of public policy topics, we're dealing with very skewed distributions um, where the mean, for example, the mean toward award is dramatically larger than the median toward award. And that's because the extreme outliers uh, on the right tail um, that kind of skew the distribution. But here, I just did a, what, what's, um, what's called a Monte Carlo distrib uh, simulation um, using, I use R, but you could use this, you could do this in Excel, I guess. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I drew random samples from a population where the mean was 5,000 and the standard deviation was 5,000. And here, up at the top, you see um, the sample size distribution. Um, uh, a key point here is what I'm plotting is not a single distribution from a single sample, for example, of five, but rather thousands of times I drew five. Okay, so thousands of samples of, of size five what you see is, even though it's an extremely small sample, the spread around that mean of 5,000 is, is really large. So these are very noisy measures. Um, but they do center on roughly 5,000. As you increase the sample size, what you see is the distributions get tighter and tighter and tighter. Now, what that means is you're buying precision. But, um, in the real world, precision, you only buy as much precision as you need because you have other things you have to do with your scarce resources. And good policy analysis does not require having the most precise methods possible. You, you just need as much precision as you can afford. And actually, these small samples um, can be informative. The problem is you don't have thousands of samples of size five. You, if you only have one sample of size five, because of that spread, you could be way off in, in your estimates. Um, and so I've had students say to me, well, that's all well and good, but I'm doing elite interviews with, with judges, you know, um, and these are qualitative interviews, so that's not relevant to me. As if somehow noise disappears when you do qualitative research. No, it's just... We can't make a plot like this for qualitative research, but you still, the this, this same concept applies. If you only interview five judges, you're going to have a noisy sample of judges. Even if you randomly sample these judges or intentionally sample them to be as different from each other as possible to try to have heterogeneity, it's still you know, a small sample. Um, and here's just how it, this affects um, uh, sampling error in, in public opinion surveys. And here, this again just makes my point that most of the benefits of sample size are in the first uh, between n of 0 and n of about 200. 
and that by the time you get past n of 1,000, if you're spending more and more money on sample size, you're throwing away money you could spend on other things. Um, you also have to ask yourself, why do we need, how bad would it be to be 5% off the true answer? In some policy domains, you just want to get the sign right. Is, is something going to be positive or is it going to be negative? You don't really need that precision. In other cases, you're actually going to expend resources based on the estimate, and being off by 5% could be quite expensive of an error. So, so you, you have to decide you know, the level of rigor or precision that's needed for the task. Very few of you will be able to do any kind of quantitative surveying in a policy lab just because of the calendar. It, it's, um, there are examples of this, but it just takes a lot of time to do, um, to actually field a survey. And um, most of you will, if you do some sort of surveying, it's going to be closer to qualitative surveying than quantitative surveying. Um, and here, um, the sample sizes tend to be kind of small, um, and they're not likely to be truly random selection. Um, and what people often do is called convenience sampling. They just take whoever is available. And I will say, my own profession, I was trained as a psychologist. Uh, the 20th century, much of the edifice of psychology in the 20th century was built on the introductory psychology student participating in an experiment for course credit. Okay, that was a convenient sample. And we were told when I was in graduate school, don't worry about it because these are human brains and it turns out college students have brains. So all you need is some brains because you're studying properties of the brain. Um, we now know that was uh, a very naive view. Um, uh, there are cultural differences, findings. A lot of the findings from that era can't be replicated in other parts of the world. Uh, um, and um, some of those findings can't even be replicated elsewhere in the U.S. with non-college students. So it really depends, now a lot of them can, but it really depends on the topic. So, um, so convenience sampling is, is not very strong. Quota sampling is you, you say, there's certain types of people I want, I'm going to make sure I get at least one from each bucket. Okay, so you set up a quota. I'm going to get some of these, some of these, some of these, and some of these to try to represent. And that, that's an improvement on convenience sampling. It leads to strange, uh, easily overlooked biases. Um, for example, if you do quota sampling, a lot of times it's very easy to fill one of your buckets um, because it's a majority, dem demographic majority category. Like, let's say you're, you're, you're doing quota sampling by different ethnicities. And, and it's much easier to find your white respondents um, than it is your um, Asian American respondents. And the Asian American respondents bin might fill more quickly than the Native American. Um, and so what happens is the bins that are harder to fill, the people that you find to fill those bins are less and less representative of their category. Sometimes it's literally time of day, like you fill all, you're doing a, a marketing survey in a mall, shopping mall. You fill all your easy bins by lunchtime, and you spend all afternoon trying to find these rare bins. Right? By the way, um, this is when people actually used to buy things in stores. Um, uh, you, I would go to the shopping malls, and when I was younger, the people with the clipboards would always approach me. And then one of the things that happens as you get older is they don't even see me. <laughs> I mean, it's just like I'm not in their target demographic. and so. I'm like, yeah, I'll answer your question, and they're just looking past me like, no, they don't even see me. So, um, purpose of sampling is, um, if you're going to have a small sample, you can at least try to make sure that you get some cases that are different enough from each other that you can suggest that there's some degree of generalizability. Um, uh, so, and this is going to be true for a lot of you doing elite interviews of people in some domain as part of your policy lab, you can, maybe phone interviews or maybe in-person interviews. Try to intentionally pick some people who are different from each other to get different perspectives. It seems obvious when I say it, 
But a lot of times when the policy analysis is over and I ask to comment on it, I'm like, why did you only talk to this kind of people? And what about this point of view? Um, so something to think about. There is, um, for difficult to reach, pop some populations don't want to be interviewed. Um, I've done studies of uh, street level crack cocaine sellers and closeted members of the US Navy who did not want to be measured, who are participating in surveys at great risk. And there are a lot of challenges involved in that. And it's very hard to draw a sample of them because since they don't want to be detected, they don't all belong to the Drug Dealers of America uh, Society and subscribe to its newsletter. So you can't draw a sample from the newsletter uh, um, and you have to come up with other strategies. And one, one of the approaches is called snowball sampling. And sometimes this can happen in policy labs where you have one, per, you, you identify one person who gives you inroads into this community. And the last thing you do at the end of the interview is, you know, who else, who else do you, would you recommend I talk to? And the idea is that although you can't identify the people you need to talk to, they can point you toward other people. Um, and help you identify more of them. And sometimes they can even make introductions for you, and that can be really helpful. Why is it called snowball sampling? I think it's called snowball sampling because in the, in the cartoons, uh, you know, Roadrunner, uh, uh, you know, the, so there's, in the cartoons, they, you, you take a little snowball, you push it down a snow-covered mountain. Oh, oh snowball. yeah, snowball. <laughs> Timber! I, I, I planned that. Um, you know, the, the snowball, by the time it reaches the bottom of the mountain, it's this huge boulder. I'm actually from the Midwest. I know snow. That doesn't happen in real snow. <laughs> if you tried to roll a snowball, it would just stop. But um, it, it, it's a, hmm? No, in the cartoons, they just, they let gravity do it. No, you have to do it yourself. That's right. Um, don't get me started on snowman technology. I, 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 I know, I'm from Michigan. I know how to make a snowman. <clears throat> okay. Validity is a much harder problem to deal with. Um, it's, uh, it's also much harder to convince stakeholders that you've addressed validity because bias is to some extent in the eye of the beholder and you may feel that you've done a very unbiased estimate in good faith but you still have to deal with the fact that you're going to have different audiences that will still perceive bias in what you've done and you have to somehow try to address their concerns and, and, and persuade them. Um, you know, you can do some random sampling to try to get different viewpoints, but if it's in a homogenous community, it's not going to work. And so here I have my favorite quote from when I used to ride the bus in Berkeley. Uh, Bush can't have been reelected. No one I know voted for him. Okay, so uh, this is going to be a problem with a lot of stakeholders you deal with in the policy analysis. Everyone in their community, in their part of the, that world, shares the same view. Um, and so, so they may view that as the dominant view of the problem. You may be talking to other people that are outside their community, and when you bring those points of view forward, um, it may not, it may surprise them, and it may sound like you're the one who's out of touch. And part of, part of your delicate argument is trying to explain to them that actually, um, they might be the ones in a bubble, right? And uh, nobody likes to hear that, but it's important. Um, so again, and I'm repeating myself here because it's such an important point. Triangulation is, can, can deal with imperfect sources, but triangulation only works if, it's, if there's heterogeneity of the sources you're trying. If, you're, if you combine a bunch of biased sources and they're all biased in the same way and they triangulate, but they all have the exact same bias, you haven't really made a more convincing story. What's convincing is when you find that, that the um, uh, uh, activist organization 
and the government representatives and the industry representatives all agree on some fact because they have three different biases and they all agree. So that's, that's the kind of triangulation you're looking for. Now, qualitative interviewing is, is probably more of an art than a science. Um, I've learned some things about how to do it. Uh, I know some people who are really, really good at it. I am not really good at it. Um, uh, some journalists are really good at it, some are not. Um, uh, just to pick on someone, I admire many things about Rachel Maddow. She's not a good interviewer. Um, Chris Hayes, who, who's on hour before her, is actually a much more effective interviewer. Um, and it's, I'm always trying to figure out, what, what is she doing wrong? Why, why doesn't she? I mean, she, um, she's a great storyteller, but it's really a skill. And so trying to think of, how do, you, how do I teach students this art that I'm not completely sure I can articulate, and I'm definitely not a master. So I'm going to tell you some things that I've learned through painful experience, um, uh, which you can take or leave, um, because they're not hard and fast rules. But a lot of you are going to be doing interviews uh, over the course of your career, and maybe over the course of a policy lab. Um, <laughs> In rare cases, you'll have a completely structured interview, and, and for the, your, your protocol for your data collection will be that everyone needs to be asked the exact same questions. And there could be good reasons for doing that for standardization. But I, what I find is much more common in, in um, policy labs is you're really having a conversation. And you, you have a list of things you want to cover by the end of the conversation. But it's going to unfold as a conversation does. Uh, in a different order for different people and with slightly different questions. Um, so you have an agenda of the questions, you, the things you want to get at, but, but not necessarily a script. Um, the, um, if, you have a, a, if you do have a script, in terms of quality of measurement, uh, arg arguably that's more desirable. And a lot of textbooks will tell you you should have the script. I find the problem with the script is that sometimes you're pretty quickly into the conversation you realize when you wrote the script, you were really clueless and you didn't really understand what the issues were. Um, and if you're going to be um, dogged about pursuing that script, even past the point where it's clear that your script is kind of clueless, you're not only failing to make a imp good impression on the person you're interviewing, but you're failing elicit from them what really is important. So being able to adapt on the fly is important. Um, at the same time, having that list of goals is important to you because sometimes they want to lead you off track because they don't want to talk about certain things. And so they want you to get preoccupied with something else to run down the clock. Now, if they really feel strongly about that, they won't talk to you in the first place. Um, but. Um, so it's, you know, that's where this becomes art rather than science. Um, students often just plunge into interviewing without being very strategic about it. And so some things you need to think about are, who are you going to interview and in what order? In what order is really important. Who you want to interview, you may want, you may identify a bunch of organizations and you want to find one representative from each of those organizations. Look at the org chart. There's a lot of thought that needs to go into at what level of the org chart do we want to talk to someone. Organizations embody the knowledge of their members, but any given person in that org chart may have a very narrow understanding of what's going on. So there's the part of the org chart you want to target if you're being strategic. But there's also access, and you may, what they allow you to target, who, who you're allowed to talk to, may differ from who you really want to talk to, and that's a challenge. There are also questions about what order in which you talk to people. For example, if you do um, some of your most important interviews first, you won't have the benefits of experience of having been through a bunch of interviews and learned what the right questions are, and you may waste a good interview. Um, so it, 
uh, without meaning any offense to your earliest interviews, you may want to break in your interview questions on some less important uh, informants before you talk to the most important ones. And this order interacts with the next bullet point. Expect to be turned down by many of your contacts. There's a really, really important, here's a pro tip. If you get turned down by someone high in an organization, that may block off the entire organization. You may lose the ability to talk to anyone else. They say, no, we don't want to participate. You can't then go to one of their underlings without possibly getting the underling in trouble. Uh, on the other hand, if you have trouble reaching an underling, um, you still may be able to jump a, above them in the queue and talk to, to someone higher. Higher is not necessarily better. The people, there's this kind of principle of executive ignorance where um, you know, the people in the mahogany row, the, the fancy offices, often don't know very much at all about what's going on in their organization. So, um, Stanford students tend to be extremely polite, but I still really have to emphasize People are really doing you a favor. You're representing the whole university. You really, really need to be extremely courteous with the people you're dealing with and respectful of their time. Part of being respectful of their time is showing up prepared. You should know basic facts about the industry or, or, or the policy domain. Um, you should impress them as an informed person, um, uh, not someone who's completely naive. It is not a good use of their time for them to have to bring you up to speed on really basic foundational concepts of their, of their world. So you need to do some homework for that. Um, and basic facts you can find just from their website. Things that, having them tell you things like you know, how many people work in your organization when you could have just looked on their website is not a good use of their time. It also you can embarrass them because they, they may not know the answer and feel like they should, and now you've embarrassed them, and that was completely unnecessary because you could have just looked it up on the website. Um, in terms of confidentiality, this is something you negotiate, but once you, having negotiated it, you absolutely have to be, you have to honor what you've negotiated, and this is really important. Um, you can ask people whether they're willing to be recorded, and a lot of people say, yeah, that's fine. A lot of people say, no, I'd rather you didn't. Don't, no argument. If they say, no, I'd rather you didn't, you say, is it okay then if I just take notes? In rare cases, they'll say, I would rather you not even take notes. Then you just have a, you don't, you don't argue with them. You just like, okay, fine, let's talk, you know? And then you go to Starbucks and write down at Pete's, go to Pete's. And, 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 and write down everything you can remember as quickly as possible, because you will forget it. Um, uh, so you negotiate the confidentiality, and then you honor it. Um, they are some people may really be entrusting you with, with information that could put their careers at risk, or their reputations at risk, and you've got to honor that. And sometimes that means you know something you really want to, this is just like journalism, there's something you really want to use but they've told you it's off the record. And this does happen with policy labs where, you know, this is not journalism school, but um, policy lab students have been told, uh, you know, I want to tell you something off the record. And when they say off the record, it doesn't mean, um, okay, I'll, I'll write it up, but I just won't use your name. It means, no, you don't write that up. The thing they told you, you can't report. Why are they telling you? Maybe to ease their conscience. But they're telling you because you can independently try to verify what they said through other means that are more public, um, you know, in Watergate, the source deep throat, follow the money. You know, basically, um, I'm not going to, you know, this, this, this source for Woodward and Bernstein at the Washington Post wouldn't tell them all the facts, but told them what you should be looking for. I'm not going to tell you, but um, so if someone says off the record, Take that seriously. Something I'm terrible at is this last one. Don't be afraid of silence. Um, by the way, I, I'm a jazz musician. I'm a terrible at, at this in jazz, too. It's, um, a good, good soloist should not be afraid of silence. But your nervousness, silence makes you, makes us, 
want to fill that vacuum. And so what will happen sometimes in a conversation is they'll give you a very short three-word answer, and then they'll just sit there. And your ten temptation, that's excruciating for me. And so immediately, I want to fill the silence, so I just start blabbing. Um, and don't overdo this, but sometimes all you need to do is, ten, nine, not out loud, by the way. <laughs> Eight, you know, do a countdown before you move on to the next thing. Because sometimes they'll then jump in and, and tell you something really important. And they're hesitating because they're like, should I say this or not? And when, when you don't fill the silence, they'll tell you something really important. So, um, you know, tr tr try, to, try to look out for that. A lot of people talk about an hourglass structure to your interviews. Um, the idea here is, um, you start with very broad questions just to get the conversation moving. Um, you don't immediately zoom in to very narrow specific things. Start with very broad questions. Toward the middle of the interview, you really narrow in to very specific things you need to get. But you need to remember to broaden out again at the end. In particular, an incredibly useful thing, um, which sounds almost like a throwaway, but it's really useful, is is there anything I didn't ask about that you think I should know about? And some of my students have gotten really, really interesting things at that point in the interview, um, where the person says, you know, you didn't ask me at all about such and such, and I think you're really missing what's really going on here, or what's about to happen in this policy space. Um, you never asked me about such and such, but really that's where the action is. And so that, that final question is not like a throwaway at the end, right before you shake their hand. It can be the most important part of the whole interview. Um, so make sure you include that. Oh, and, and don't let them see your jaw drop. If it's something truly shocking, you have to be absolutely poker faced and just, um, I don't, why do I say that actually? Is there anything wrong with having your jaw drop? Because it's an art, I don't know. If it were science, I could tell you jaw dropping is bad, but actually I don't know that jaw dropping is bad. Maybe you should act surprised. But um, just be honest. Okay, content analysis is a different form of data collection. And, and instead of going out and interrogating people, we're interrogating documents. And, and this is, we're in a new era where this is, the, I think this is the great professional equalizer for junior professionals and junior researchers because it is now possible for you to do really high level, ambitious empirical research without any government grant money. Because it, whereas it might have taken, when I worked at the Rand Corporation, we did, we did studies of, um, of, of tort cases where we had to send teams of people to courthouses around the US to go into their basements and pull out bankers' boxes of files and go through all these files and code information. And it was extremely labor intensive, extremely expensive. These days, you know, if you're skilled at doing Google searches, you can find all sorts of quantitative data, but also textual data. Um, and uh, so there's a lot you can do um, just collecting information that's on the, the web. And um, the, uh, the, there is a discipline to content analysis, and we don't have time to talk about it today, but usually there's some sort of coding scheme for how you operationalize the things you're interested in. Um, and that's important for reproducibility because someone else should be able to check and find the same things that you did. Reproducibility means you actually include in your report the search terms you used. So other people can do a search too. And um, every year, some student will write a paper for me in which they say, no one has ever done a study on X. And I'm like, ah, gotcha. And then I go to Google Scholar and try to see how quickly I can find a study on X. And I always find a study on X because everything has been studied at least once. And um, in the same way, you, you know, you're going to want to be very transparent about how you pull down information so that other people can check and see, were you just um, 
cherry picking the, the best examples that support your hypothesis, or were you doing a really fair search? Um, there, are, there are a lot of new tools for taking textual data and, and processing it. Um, uh, text analysis, lexical analysis. This, this is actually a, a real cutting edge form of legal scholarship. So increasingly people now are using machine learning algorithms to go through legal opinions and extract patterns from them. And so you're going to see more and more of this over the course of your career. Um, you know, to really be hardcore about it, it requires some software training. There are, there are some websites that will do word clouds for you, but beyond word clouds to, to do some of the more sophisticated stuff, take some, some computer programming. Um, the R software environment has got a lot of packages for, for, for doing this. And it, it's not rocket science, but it's also not trivial. But anyway, it's good to know about that. It takes some time, and um, you're not going to be able to teach yourself all that programming probably over the course of a, if you don't already have those chops, um, you know, it may be limits to what you can achieve during, during one quarter or two quarters. But I want to make sure you know about this because it really, it really does make it possible for junior uh, researchers to um, do very ambitious empirical work without getting any kind of having to get some sort of government funding, which could take years and is very hard to do. So. Any questions about any of that? Um, all of you are going to be doing web searches on your topic, and uh, you're all very experienced at this, but being experienced is not the same thing as being good at it, and there, there, are, certain, there are certain web searches that students present to me that just connote to me, they just signal to me, amateur, amateur, uh, so I, it's, hard to, it's, it's hard to articulate I've been trying to, for years to figure out what sets off that voice in my head, what are the things. So some of this will seem obvious to you, and yet your peers do it all the time. Um, uh, like citing obviously biased, very partisan sources, um, using, pulling down some white paper on, a, on capital punishment um, and using it as your source of facts is great, but what if that organization is the ACLU? They're going to have a certain point of view, in the, in, and that's going to influence the facts they put up. Now, they may be pretty honest broker of the facts they put up, but you're going to want to check some other websites. Um, and this includes government websites. Just because it's the government doesn't mean it's an unbiased source. Um, I mean, there, there are enormous biases in the way the government reports drug statistics. Um, I mean, not just like um, accidental biases, but like really politically driven decisions about how things get um, reported that um, can skew your, your judgment. Um, people often cite very remote sources for very important concepts. And this is something that connotes amateur if you're, if you are citing um, um, some NGO in, in the city of Oakland for the importance of uh, self-efficacy as a trait in, um, in, in helping people uh, uh, look for work, uh, and you don't know that self-efficacy um, the father of self-efficacy is Albert Bandura, who's one of the most famous psychologists of, of the past century at Stanford. And you don't cite Bandura, you cite this, this organization. It just looks like, it just looks amateurish. So try to look for the primary sources. And Google Scholar, Google Scholar is a fantastic way to get information. Um, under, when you find a site in Google Scholar, in the bottom left-hand corner, it will say cited by with a number. That's an incredibly important field right there. Not just the sheer number, but if you click on that site, you will find all the people that have cited that article. This is especially good when you find a really good study on your topic, but it was conducted in 2007. And you don't want to just trust that that was the last word. 
if it's a really good study, use Google Scholar to find out who has cited that since 2007. And you look at those more, more recent sites to try to find out what has been done since then. In particular, did someone debunk that study and show that it was actually a flawed study, which would be very embarrassing. You know, you make a study, you're the centerpiece of your analysis, and later you find out it doesn't hold up. Um, the uh, uh, peer-reviewed journals have more credibility for empirical work than non-peer-reviewed journals. Law reviews, by the way, are not peer-reviewed in the sense I'm using the term. Um, there, there's review that goes on in law reviews, but it's not what we mean by peer review. Um, and I'll have to say, I'm, the law review system baffles me. Uh, it's, um, <laughs> um, the, um, when impossible for empirical work, the most useful sources for you are going to be meta-analyses, because meta-analyses are studies that review, not only review other studies that have been done, but they explicitly statistically combine the data, merge the data across studies, and they tell you the, the overall finding. And meta-analyses are not perfect, but they're, they're a very, very useful source of evidence for you, because you're not just summarizing a single study, you're summarizing a whole bunch of studies. And there you get the power of aggregation again. You mentioned 2007. What year was the That's a painful question because I'm getting older. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm finding that some of, some of my greatest hits are receding into the, into the past. I, I recently came across um, kind of a backhanded praise of of a, a 2001 book of mine, someone online, someone on Twitter said, that's an amazing book. It's completely out of date, but it's an amazing book. I was like, mm, but, but, but they're right. I mean, it was like a 2001 book on drug legalization is completely out of date. Um, and so it's partly going to depend on your topic. Um, you can, in Google Scholar, on the left-hand column, you can pick um, you can say since a certain year to just zero in on the more recent ones. And what you will find is for certain topics, um, the heyday of research on that topic was in a certain decade, and most of the studies were done in a certain area, and then it really trails off. Um, but there are some areas where there are some topics that are so cutting edge that if you only rely on things that have already been published, you're really not up with the topic. So uh, in the areas for which I'm a specialist, I see things, I see manuscripts for years before they finally come out in print. By the time they come out in print, we've already moved on. And it's, it's like archiving the study. But I saw, I've, you know, I may have on my hard disk three different versions of this paper as it, as it evolved from a conference talk to, and, um, I mean, that, that informal process used to incredibly favor elite universities because we were part of, you know, places like Stanford were part of the, this tight network of sharing of documents and people sending you things. And, and, um, and then you would find less elite universities were kind of not part of, tapped into that, and people from other countries were not tapped into that. And that was a real distortion, a real bias. And one of the great things that's happened now is the web is making it increasingly easy to give everyone fair access so there's no special privilege to being you know, a Stanford professor. Um, but for a lot of public policy topics, um, while peer review is important, some of the cutting edge stuff may not yet have been published. So uh, for example, you will often find NEBR, National Economic Bureau of Research, working papers. Um, on uh, some econometric study of some topic that's relevant to antitrust or, or um, gun control or whatever the topic is. And that, that working paper may be the most important source available right now in that topic because it's brand new, but it's really you know, done by a top level researcher. And everybody's looking at that. And it'll eventually get published, but 
you need to use it now. So. Um, in, in our last section, we were talking about describing the world, surveys, interviews, sources of evidence to describe the world. I just want to end today by, by talking about the challenges involved in going beyond description to, to actually drawing inferences about cause and effect, which is usually what people are trying to do in policy analysis. Usually policy analysis in, in the policy labs, sometimes you're just trying to measure something. But usually the reason you're trying to measure things is because people want to make action decisions about actively intervening in the world to try to change the world. And they want to use your analysis to help them figure out should we, how should we intervene in the world. And I mean, the short version of what I'm about to say, you'll all nod your head and say, oh yeah, correlation does not equal causation, because you've all heard that before. But I want to just give some examples to illustrate just how difficult it is to draw these inferences and the kinds of common in inferences that students draw from their data that um, do not hold up well in the rough and tumble of, of uh, policy debate. Um, the kind of things that are easy for other organizations to shoot down as invalid inferences. So here is from 2000 to 2009, per capita cheese consumption and the number of people who died becoming tangled in their bed sheets. And you see here a very tight correlation between the two. Right? And our brains, you know, this is a Stanford, this is a self-selected sample of people who like to think and are, are, are quick thinkers. And you're all generating theories <laughs> that connect uh, cheese consumption and getting tangled in your bed sheets. And I'm not going to argue with you about whether your theories are right. I'm just going to argue about whether this particular chart, which is, by the way, this is real data, whether it's at all meaningful. This comes from a, a website um, called Spurious Correlations. And every time you click on your mouse, it will generate one of these for you. And it's great fun. And it only takes like three clicks to, to, to make you extremely reticent to ever present something like this as a correlation. Because uh, there are all sorts of reasons why things can be correlated that uh, are, are actually quite meaningless. And um, here's another example. Uh, from another mouse click when I went to the site. Total revenue generated by, um, these are computer game arcades, correlates with computer science doctorates award in the US. This one is interesting. Because if you didn't know this came from the Spurious Correlation site, this one, it's easier to tell a story for this one, I think, than the, the cheese one. You could probably make up some story about why this is a real thing. And it could be a real thing. The fact. The fact that I'm presenting, it doesn't mean that I know that this is a, a, a spurious correlation. It just means the fact that it's a correlation doesn't necessarily mean it's meaningful. So part of the challenge is trying to figure out whether two things that are correlated are actually causally related. And in the jargon of social science, we call that internal validity. To distinguish that from external validity, and external validity is a secondary question, which is, is what you learned in this study generalizable to other settings? Okay. Um, so a lot of social science is a trade-off between internal validity and external validity. So it's easy to criticize psychology experiments for using under college undergraduates as their source, because there are obvious problems with external validity or generalizability or concerns about it, generalizability. But in fairness, the purpose of those studies is to do experiments with random assignment to condition. And what those researchers are, are interested in is less about generalizability to other settings, but correctly identifying the true cause in my experiment of someone's judgment. And so those studies are actually very rigorous with respect to internal validity. They've just purchased high internal validity at the cost of uh, low external validity. And uh, that's a tough, it's tough to avoid that trade-off. Um, a lot of people now do uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk studies 
These are basically people who get paid to participate in studies. You actually get more diversity in terms of demographics with an Amazon Turk sample, but there, it just raises other questions of external validity, like who, who participates in study just to make money? How different are they than the rest of the world? Now, a big problem we have to deal with in, in evaluating interventions is confounding. And confounding refers to something that varies with your intervention that is really producing the results you see. Okay. So, for example, uh, in the drug treatment literature, drug treatment advocates uh, who uh, would like to see a shift in emphasis from criminal justice sanctions toward treatment as a way of dealing with addiction will often cite the correlation, correlational statistics about positive um, drug treatment experiences. Um, and you can find such correlations. There's, there's a, uh, even though I, I, I favor a drug treatment over incarceration as a way of dealing with drug problems, that's a very problematic inference from these studies. And the reason is because there's this huge self-selection bias in who participates in some of these treatment studies. There's a very high dropout rate. And so you're only seeing the most motivated people complete the study. If, if you only see the most motivated people complete the study, then the fact that they go drug-free for the next six months may just reflect their motivation to change rather than anything about the actual treatment intervention. Um, and if you, if you included the other people that dropped out in the study, the results would look much less favorable. Um, there are a lot of studies in psychology trying to make claims about birth order, how first children are different from second children. That's actually very tricky to do in any given study because necessarily the firstborn is older than the second born. So is it really an order effect or is it just an age effect? And it's very hard to separate order eff age effects from birth order effects. Um, marijuana use, strong correlation with traffic fatalities. Um, if judged by can you detect THC or its metabolites in the blood of someone who dies in a car accident. But a problem is in, in uh, over half the cases where they find some metabolite of THC, they also find alcohol in the bloodstream. So is it the marijuana that caused the accident? Is it the alcohol? Is it the two in combination? These are, quite, these are questions that the, cor that the correlational data just don't answer for you. Um, early studies compared six-person juries to 12-person juries and argued uh, for the you know, certain conclusions based on those results. I won't even tell the cons conclusions because the conclusions were wrong. Um, because the researchers failed to take into account that the cases that were assigned to six-person juries were much less serious cases than the cases assigned to 12-person juries. And so they confounded seriousness with jury size un unwittingly and reached inferences that were wrong. Now, Donald Campbell, the late Donald Campbell, came up a list with a list of seven threats to internal validity. Um, I know a, a UC Santa Cruz professor who I was having lunch with him once, and he pulled out a laminated card from his wallet. He had a laminated this list as a laminated card in his wallet. And um, so I encourage you all to go get this laminated. It's only seven things. Did, did he really need it in his wallet? I mean, could he me couldn't he memorize seven things? Uh, now, as I'm getting older, that seems hard to memorize seven things. But, um, but it's, I think it was really, it, 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 it's partly a, um, his way of reminding himself, I can be fooled. And I want to I wanna always remember not to get fooled, not to get ahead of myself, get too excited about findings. And so the, I'm not going to go through this list of seven. But um, you can find these on Google. But there are certain known fallacies in the interpretation of correlational evidence that happen again and again and again. And professional researchers get really quick at seeing them. And um, 
and, they, and the researchers think that they are informing a topic and they don't realize that they haven't dealt with these really rudimentary threats. And I'll just give you a couple examples. History it, artifact is the idea that if you measure things over time, um, your intervention may have happened between the first measurement and the second, but lots of other things also happen between the first measurement and the second measurement. Um, and uh, you need to figure out all the things that happen between the first measurement and the second measurement and make sure that it's really your intervention that is doing the work rather than something else that happened. Um, uh, you know, I've known people who were doing really big longitudinal studies, which they launched right before the Great Recession. And basically their studies were ruined because this was like an exogenous shock to the system that swamped anything else that they were studying because uh, it was such a, and you see the same thing with earthquakes and, and, and other kinds of what statisticians call exogenous shocks to the system. Uh, now testing is the idea that the mere act of measuring something can, can change people's behavior. And this is, um, if you've taken physics, this may sound something like the um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It has nothing to do with that, as far as I can tell. Um, it's, it's much more prosaic explanation, which is just that um, by asking people questions, you're, you're triggering a cognitive process that they may not have gone into otherwise. And, and, and that itself is an intervention. And that itself can actually change people's thinking. So um, we know this with uh, practice effects on, on tests, you know, preparing for the SATs. There are big practice effects of, of taking it more than once. Um, and there are lots of other examples. There, um, Elizabeth Loftus, a, a law professor at UC Irvine, uh, when she used to be uh, at the University of Washington, um, she was actually sued uh, by a local attorney for contaminating the jury pool because she had passed out to the jury pool members in the jury assembly room a questionnaire asking them um, about uh, to make recommendation, compensatory damage uh, recommendations in a very short two-page case summary. And her questionnaire asked them things like, um, do you think that the uh, plaintiff uh, was insured and will collect from their insurance company? Did you take into a, should, did you uh, adjust the compensation for, for interest to, to pay them, uh, you know, uh, with interest? Um, did you take into account their lawyer fees? These are all really important questions to ask to understand the results. But what, basically what she did was she told these jurors, these are things you need to think about. But these are all things that judges do not tell jurors to think about. They, arguably, they should, but they don't. And so she really, in my view, she did contaminate the, the pool. Um, we called um, Institute for Civil Justice at RAND when I was there. Deborah Hensler, who's on the faculty here, was my boss. And we, um, we did random digit dial survey of 25,000 American households trying to identify people who were seriously active accidentally injured in the past 12 months because we wanted to find out whether they sought compensation and whether they did it through the tort system. Um, we, serious concerns were raised about asking 25,000 households, did you talk to a lawyer? Because the concern was that our study would trigger a whole bunch of lawsuits that wouldn't have otherwise happened. And in fact, in hindsight, that was a valid concern because one of the findings of the study was the vast majority of people who are injured say it never even occurred to them to file a lawsuit against anyone. Especially, that was particularly striking, people who were injured with consumer products. Almost, you know, people may think there's a litigation explosion, but in, in fact, most people who hurt themselves with a commercial product blame themselves, and it never even occurs to them that maybe they ought to blame the corporation. So, you know, so this, this issue of testing is a real thing. I'm going to skip over this one and go to this one. Um, selection you're often comparing two different groups in a policy analysis. And you just need to bear in mind that these groups may differ in the treatments that they receive, whether they've been exposed to an intervention. But they also may differ in personal characteristics that led them to be in these different groups. 
So an example would be there was an early empirical literature on um, Catholic schools uh, and at the quality of education in Catholic schools versus public schools, um, which treated this as if it were random assignment to condition. But of course, it's not random assignment. The families that choose to send their kid to a Catholic school are different in all sorts of ways from uh, parents who send their kids to a uh, uh, public school. Um, same thing with co-educational um, versus all women's colleges. Um, there, are, there were early studies in the literature looking at the advantages of being at an all-women's college, which may, there may be such advantages, but the studies failed to take into account that all women's colleges are private, exclusive, very expensive colleges that differ in a lot of ways from some of the comparison schools. So these are the kind of things, as soon as you point out the problem, it seems obvious. So you think, of course, I would have known that. But a lot of times people get pretty far along in their study before they realize that they've created these kinds of selection biases. Um, now, uh, to some extent, you can solve these problems um, by doing uh, some sort of matching. So you've got a group that receives an intervention, and you want to make a comparison to people who don't receive the intervention. So you try to find people who don't receive the intervention who are as similar as possible in their personal characteristics to the treatment group. Um, and this is, this is better than nothing, but we've learned over time that these, the matching is very vulnerable and not very effective. And the problem is because people tend to match on, the jargon is match on the observables. So they match on gender, age, um, maybe ethnicity, just two or three variables. And so they, they say, you know, these samples are almost identical in their age distribution, their gender distribution. But they fail to match in all sorts of other things that really differ. So think about your demographic group. Think about the intersection of your age, your ethnicity, and your gender. Are you interchangeable with everyone else who has those characteristics? Do you feel like we could swap you out for one of them and no one would notice the difference? You probably don't feel that way. Um, and, and you're right. Um, because that's a very crude way to match. Um, so matching is just not going to solve a lot of the problems. The gold standard um, for causal inference is to randomly assign people to conditions so that there can be no relationship between their pre-existing characteristics and which condition they, they receive, whether they receive the intervention or not, because it's totally determined at random. Um, and if we had time, I could do some computer simulations for you and, and just show you how, um, how powerful this is. At, but the thing about random assignment is, random assignment is, is, it is as if you matched on every possible characteristic. So you think of the most obscure characteristic, you know. Did you like the first Star Trek series better than the next generation? Um, you probably don't, choose, there's probably never been a matching study where that was one of the criteria, but every study that's ever used random assignment has equated on that. Because if you have a large enough sample, you will, you will not find statistically more next generation fans in one group than the other um, at, a, at a rate beyond chance levels. So you're controlling for every possible thing you can think of when you do random assignment. It's just very difficult to do in real world policy analysis for, for ethical reasons, legal reasons, political reasons, and it's almost never done in policy labs. Um, so it's, it's going to be the aspiration, but it's not going to be what you'll actually be able to do. Um, there are a variety of uh, strategies that are called quasi-experimental that don't use random assignment, but try to approximate that. And here I'm just tossing up some jargon so you Learn, rec learn to recognize some of the terms that you will encounter as you're doing reading on your topics. Um, and every one of these terms, there's actually a good Wikipedia page for most of these. Wikipedia has got, in terms of statistical information, the quality of Wikipedia has grown enormously over the past decade. Um, so 
you may see references to interrupted time series designs, regression discontinuity designs, difference and difference analysis, propensity score matching. Um, John Donahue here at the law school has used something called synthetic control group. These are all fancy statistical methods for approximating random assignment to condition. Um, they've all been shown to be imperfect. They are not subst true substitutes, but they are pretty good second best. And um, because they don't eliminate, eliminate every possible alternative interpretation of a correlation, but they rule out a whole lot of interpretations. So they reduce the number of ways that you could fool yourself. Um, a lot of you, one of the most common forms of evidence you will encounter in researching your topics will be time series plots where they show measures of something over time. And it's really tempting to look at these time series plots and see patterns in them. Um, so this is um, average daily number of calls to Cincinnati. To, so there used to be these things um, called dial phones that actually had a little coily cable that came out of them. And if you needed um, uh, to find a phone number, you dial 41411. <laughs> And someone would say directory assistance, and they would you'd give them a name, and they would give you the number. Um, and they, Cincinnati uh, started charging 20 cents per call. Um, and uh, what month number did they start charging? Look at the plot. You think you can tell when they started charging? 145. This is this is an extremely unusual time series plot in that. There's almost no ambiguity about what's going on here. You look at this and you say, Cincinnati people are price sensitive. And when you start charging for this, you cut way back. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. You, know, you could argue about that. But it's, it's a clear effect. But this is not what time series data usually look like. So here are, I've blocked out most of these time series. But here are five different time series. And I vertically stack them. And each one of them has the exact same slope at the point of an intervention. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the blind and let you see, even though at the point of the intervention, there's this rising slope, um, there are actually five very different qualitative patterns. And you will see things, something like this, when you're eyeballing time series all the time. Situations like A and B. It's plausible that the intervention really had an effect. And the reason is because it was flat or declining before the intervention, but it actually changes directions at the point of the intervention. Now, in A, it's a, it's a one-time permanent or seemingly permanent effect of the intervention that lasts. In B, it's a temporary effect. B is actually more common in A in real data. We often see that government interventions have an effect. It's just it doesn't last very long. Like um, traffic um, roadside sobriety testing has a big deterrent effect for a few days, but it tends to wear off after a while. Um, uh, now, C is a little more ambiguous because it's true that it, the intervention brings about a rise, but it was already rising slightly before the intervention, right? So how do we know it's really the intervention that brought about the rise? In the case of D, the slope at the point of the intervention is exactly the same as A, B, and C. But it's not at all persuasive because it was, it's following a steady rise. And it, it's pretty clear here that the intervention had nothing to do with it. It was already rising. Um, and then E is just a mess. E is going all over the place. And E is what almost all time series really look like. Um, so uh, a quick example of how you can fool yourself with time series analysis. So I wanted to look at the effect of uh, drug decriminalization decriminal in Italy. Um, not widely known, but they uh, removed uh, personal penalties for personal possession of any psychoactive drug in 1975. They didn't measure very many things, but the one measure I could find over time was um, uh, drug-related deaths. Not a great measure, but it's like you know, you go where the light is good, and, and so I'm under the lamppost uh, there looking there. And, and actually, when I first did this analysis, it was pretty striking, because um, 
So they depenalize drugs and the drug death rate, um, the drug death rate is rising. And then they depenalize drugs. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's, this is all during the depenalization period. So they've got a problem of rising drug deaths under depenalization. In 1990, they repenalize, and suddenly it, the drug deaths drop off. And it looks like, oh, the penalties really save lives. And then, this being Italy, three years later, they change the policy again, um, and, uh, and the drug deaths start rising again. So I look at this. And here I want to come back to this point I started with. I want to end with the point I started with, the problem of motivated reasoning. I was on record at the point I did this analysis. I had already said in print that I believe that drug penalties had very little to do with outcomes like drug-related deaths, that, um, that, that a deterrent strategy was not an effective way of dealing with these problems. This was evidence that ran very counter to what I had said. If it had come out the way consistent with what I had written before, I probably would have stopped here. But only because I was worried about being embarrassed by conflicting findings did I do additional analyses. Now, the additional analyses I, I'm about to show you were good analyses to do to clarify what's going on. But at the same time, the problem is I only did those because I didn't like the results. And so that's a clear professional bias on my part. So let me just show you. If you look at Spain and Germany, Spain also depenalized drugs in 1975, but never repenalized them. But you see the same kind of qualitative pattern. Germany never depenalized drugs. And you see not exactly the same pattern, but a similar pattern. When you look across these three countries, it becomes apparent that what's going on here has nothing to do with drug policies. There's some other forces that are driving drug-related deaths in Europe at this time. Um, but if you cherry pick the evidence, you can tell st different stories by just which particular pieces of evidence you choose. So um, I'm going to wrap up at this point by saying, um, you know, I think of myself as an honest broker, and I aspire to that. But we, we all need to worry about whether we only use rigor when it supports what we want to find. And part of your job as a policy analysis is to try to impose quality, even if you don't like where it's leading. Um, that's part of, the, that's part of your, your role responsibility when you take on the role of policy analysis. Anyway, thank you for this. has been a long morning, a lot to cover. Um, thank you for being an attentive audience, and I hope you have a good uh, afternoon. So, see you.